Before we get into the film, I just wanted to say a little bit about the Dolby Institute. Um, uh, Dolby Laboratories is probably, uh, obviously, a company that uh, you've heard of uh, in the past. Um, Dolby exists basically to make your experience uh, encountering storytelling in whatever medium uh, you're experiencing in as great as possible. And that goes from uh, Atmos, Dolby Atmos presentation in cinemas uh, to your television experience at home through your home theater uh, to consuming uh, you know, video clips and, and film uh, bits on your mobile devices. So that's kind of the business that we're in. The Dolby Initiative, uh, the Dolby Institute is a new initiative uh, of the company uh, that we just basically started this year. Uh, to engage um, the artists directly at the very beginning of the process uh, to provide education uh, and support uh, for the creative process and thinking creatively about sound and picture as storytelling tools from the very beginning of the process. So um, this is a, a program that we've sponsored, which is uh, I'm very pleased to, to, to say is a, a deep dive into the sound craft on the film Ain't Them Body Saints. And uh, I'm just thrilled. This is, we've been doing a number of these panels uh, at, at film festivals around for the past um, several months talking about the, the craft of sound design and cinema. Uh, but this is the first time that we're actually doing a deep dive into one particular film with, uh, with the creative staff on the film. And I'm very excited uh, uh, to talk about that. Um, so uh, David, do you want to talk about the film and how it came together and sort of wh wh the, how the creative process started for you? Um, yeah, I wrote I wrote the movie in in 2010 ish, like r finished it around the beginning of 2011. And Toby and I and our other uh, partner James M. Johnston had intended to just go off and find some small town in Texas to shoot in that year, like later that fall. And we were we were in the process of like putting the pieces together to make that happen on a, on um, on a movie. Like our last film was like a twelve thousand dollar feature, and we thought this would be roughly you know in that same ballpark and and then one thing led to another and uh, you know a few months later it got a little bit bigger and which was great we were still making it you know very it was very handmade it was very we were you know just putting it together by the the skin of our teeth as they say but it was you know a little bit bigger than we had to a, a bigger canvas than we had before to work with and one of the things we were able to do with that was then spend a little bit more time on sound, which was great because that's always been one of the most important parts of the filmmaking process to me. And to the extent that it like a lot often is written into the script, like ideas for sound and and um, and I work in post production a lot as an editor and, and so I know exactly how useful it can be to tell a story. Uh, I was just curious about, you know, coming from that background and, and editing in post, how does that affect you as a writer, you know, when you're when you're thinking about the script you know, writing it out, and then as you as you get on set and you start to as, as you start to work, it's really impossible not to have that mindset when you're starting to write a project, and and you are writing the beginning of a scene, knowing like, well, here's how we would cut into this moment, and 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 that goes for sound too. Like you can imagine, like you might describe. I found this, you know, um, when I was when we were pr breaking the script down for production, and and. I describe like a flock of birds and they're like, well, we need to hire the bird wrangler. I'm like, no, 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 that's just the sound that we hear. We don't need to see them. And, and I always will just put things in there, like things that will like, a, like grace notes, affectations, and, and things that like contribute to the, the reader's experience, but that will hopefully translate through to the movie. But it's impossible not to think in that, in, in that way when you are approaching, you know, when you're walking on the set, you're thinking about, well, we're going to see this set from the first time from this angle. What's the next angle going to be? How will that cut together? Do I need that third angle that we were talking about? Maybe we can just cover it in a master. You're always thinking that way, um, for better or worse. Especially as time gets tight on the day, Especially right? as time gets tight. You just start thinking, like, well, how is this practically going to cut together? What am I going to see at the end of the day? What can we do, especially when time's running out and you don't have enough time to get everything you wanted? Like, rather than get a, a shortage of material, think of, like, a new plan of attack that can get everything you wanted encompassed in, in, a, in a, from a different angle, from a different, and not just a camera angle, from like, you know, a different mindset, like, and that was really helpful. Sometimes you shoot yourself in the foot a little bit by saying, I don't, I don't need that, and then later on you wish you had it, but m more often than not, it's, it's very helpful. Tell me a little bit about how you two started working together and, and how that relationship worked on this film. Well, 
um, it, post-production, uh, we met on a on a, like a small horror film in Dallas where we were both just helping friends out. Um, but then I was an editor, and I didn't know how to do something. And somebody recommended David, and he showed up, and we got jammed into like a 24-hour straight session. What, what the, what the the song that we were editing too? Like a Spice Girl song. Oh man! Yeah. And and we became fast friends. And within like a week of doing that, we were writing together. And uh, ever since, that was like 2006, we've been working together. Um, but you've got a background in music, right? You're, I, I, I mean, you, I, gotta, you, you, you do have a sort of rock and roll look. I, <laughs> I seriously, life falls apart when I cut my hair. Um, That's true. Do you, lo- do you lose your power when you cut your hair? It's turning out, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I was in a rock and roll band called the Polyphonic Spree. I would toured from like 2000 to 2006. Found a job. You got fans in the front row. <laughs> yeah. It was super fun. It, it was a really cool thing to do when you don't know what you want to do with your life. Um, and I found film around then, uh, shortly before meeting David, and uh, I don't know, I just kind of had a knack for it. But specifically, you know, David and I would be creating together. We started writing together, and then, like, turns out what I was doing was producing. I had no clue that that's what I was doing, but that's right. what I was doing. So are you thinking about music from the very beginning? Because oh. of the background? Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, we both do. So I'm just like, what do you want for this? Like, w- how many tunes do you need? Because we know we can, like he said in the script, we know which parts have song songs. As far as the score, that's definitely more him. That's a different, yeah, that's a different process, but. For sure. Cool, and then Kent, uh, you've obviously, um, not obviously, but I know you, we, we, we were, uh, I ran Skywalker Sound for about 10 years, uh, so we are, are old uh, working uh, collaborators from up north at, uh, at Skywalker, uh, and I know you, you're a musician as well, so you've got, you've got a, a pretty heavy music presence on, uh, on this film. Music runs through the, the soundtrack to this film, definitely, <clears throat> but I wanted to jump in and point out for people who might not know um, that much about film craft that David said something that's completely unique and generally totally untrue. (coughs) And he said, it's impossible not to think about sound when you're working on the film. And that is so rare and so special (laughs) and generally not true at all. And it's sort of what made this collaboration so exciting, um, I think, for us back and forth, is that he is thinking about sound when many, many directors are not. He talks about sound being on the page. And when he's shooting, he's got ideas for sound. And we were introduced through a mutual friend, a producer, um, with whom I'd worked before on several other pictures. And he said, you know, Ken, I think you're really going to like working with these guys. And these guys have an ear for sound, and they're going to want to soak up as many ideas as you can throw at them. And so we got involved early on, which is also rare to have the sound post-production or or, uh, sound designer involved from shooting. But I actually went out with these guys to Louisiana while they were shooting, recorded a whole bunch of natural sounds that create, that contribute to creating the setting of this film, which is a big part of the film. The film is is very tonal, and that's done through light and color and photography, but also through sound. And what enabled that to happen was, you know, David's willingness and and vision, uh, whatever the acoustic <laughs> equivalent of vision is. I don't know what that is, uh, but early collaboration really was something special about this film that allowed us to have a lot of time, comparatively, to bounce ideas back and forth and to really weave threads into the film rather than just come in at the end and say, now what what sound do you need to hear? So there is sound, um, as Toby was mentioning, songs that are in the script from the earliest stage were things that he started to develop. And then as soon as David and I were speaking about the, the concepts and the tropes of the film, uh, we were able to be developing those ideas actually as the footage was coming down. So all of that is rare and special and unique. And it's also great to have that early collaboration because at the end of the day, you know, we didn't, we had, we worked together in post a total of 11 days together. <laughs> and, and that's because, you know, it is still a very low budget movie and we had to, we didn't have a lot of time. So having that, you know, preparation and conversation and collaboration in advance really assisted us in you know powering through those total of 11 days i know yeah. you worked on it more but like those are the days that i was i was there right a lot of conversations made up for the lack of our uh the financial lack of our ability to really be collaborating in the same room over the course of several months which is what happens on bigger bigger films 
Well, I'm, I'm, that that's actually a fantastic point that you guys bring up that that um, I just want to impress upon everybody. You know, usually when we put together a panel on sound design for film, you know, w- w- we'll talk about a movie like Man of Steel or something like that that has very obvious, you know, sound designy kind of moments in it. But that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about this conversation today is because really not enough attention is paid uh, to sound design for independent film, and I, I would say especially sound design uh, for low budget films. Um, because you made the great point about, you know, sound is a storytelling tool and you can hear stuff that you don't necessarily have to see. Um, and that can solve a lot of problems for you as, a, as you know, as Absolutely. a writer. So um, why don't we take a look at the first clip? Um, this yeah. is from the opening of the, uh, very close to the opening of the movie. Yeah, this is within the first few minutes of the movie and it's sort of like before the, you know, it's like the preamble that sets up the, sets up the story basically. Okay, you want to roll the first clip please? I know I've seen the film uh, a couple of times now, and one of the things I noticed right away is, is um, you know, the. By the way, the film won the Best Cinematography Award at, at Sundance in January. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think you know, had there been a Sound Design Award, it probably would have won that as well. Uh, but I wanted to to get your thoughts about you know one of the things I noticed immediately about the track when I heard it uh, w- was how um, very deliberate it is. Um, every sound effect. It feels like it's very specifically thought out, very specifically placed spatially as well as, you know, narratively within the context of the film. And I think you did that too with the cinematography. Um, you know, very often in, in in film sound design, there's the phrase "see a sound, hear a sound," uh, which means that you know you literally cover everything that's happening on screen with a sound effect. But you don't do that here. I think the track is almost as noteworthy for the sounds that aren't there as as the ones that are. So I wanted you guys to talk a little bit about that and and how that you know, kind of uh, how that aesthetic came about for you. Do you want to start? Sure, I guess. Uh, thanks for noticing that. <laughs> it's, um, it's true that there tends to be a convention, you know, see a cop, hear a cop radio is generally how that works. Although in this movie, we do hear some cop radios that we needed to hear uh, because of the cops there. <laughs> but, um, you know, this... I think that an effective soundtrack really knows how to navigate between an objective and a subjective experience. And what that means acoustically is being able to transition between what one of the characters is hearing or perceiving and what you as an observer are meant to be hearing according to the director. And um, you can almost play any scene in a movie both ways. And the question is, which is the best way dramatically to help the audience move with the characters through their particular um, dramatic arc? And so that contributes a lot to what we don't hear. <coughs> Situations where certain characters, we're, we're being subjective with individual characters, and so there are things that we don't hear. And we have the benefit of being the super viewer, and so there are things that nobody in the movie is hearing that we get to hear. And that was one of the benefits of having long discussions in advance with David about uh, the tone of the film and um, a kind of equivalent dreamy quality to match what you saw with the cinematography. This movie is a dream in a way. It's evocative of a different time, a time that feels, well, maybe it's fairly recent, but also it's kind of gone. There are no specific indicators of what time it is, but we know it's not now. And I think that acoustically, having things that are there and not there, and you never really know which, is reminiscent of a dream. I think I, did I hear an IBM Selectric in (laughs) in certain scenes? I think you probably did. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There are no cell phones in this movie. No cell phones in this movie. None whatsoever. We had a motif that we developed, and and this is as good a time to bring this up as as any other. Um, We were talking about different sonic signatures for different characters, and Ben Foster's character... um, as you'll see through the film, uh, has a sort of a goodness to him, a, a kind of a simple goodness to him. And so in joking around, I said, well, he's kind of the angel of the movie in, in some silly way. And what if we play bells uh, in almost any scene that he's in? And David said, I like that. Let's see where we go with that. And so there really literally are bells in almost every scene that he's in. Usually they take the form of railroad crossing bells, and that's a really evocative sound for most people. You hear a crossing bell or uh, what they call a a grade uh, crossing and the train horn, and that signifies transition, motion, movement, people uh, in a point in their lives where things are changing, and that's definitely true of this character. Uh, The scene you just heard, the shootout, 
uh, we had a crossing bell there, and it blends so beautifully with the music that I think the composer will get credit for it because it just sounds like an element of the that music. That happens a couple times where it really just it, it feels so ingrained into the overall like musicality of a scene. I think maybe in the next clip. So we're going to see a, uh, another clip where um, our main character, Ruth, walks to church, and there's a beautiful uh, bit of music score. And just listen for the the Ben Foster bells in there. <laughs> well, I was uh, curious about that too, because the, the, one of the things that I noticed right away at the head of the scene is, you know, you're, you're hearing tones. And, but to me, this is sort of some of the most interesting, compelling, you know, sound territory. You're not sure if it's score or if it's sound design or sound effects. And, and how did you and the composer work together on that? Mm, I wish we had been able to communicate more, but it was a beautiful serendipity is really what it was. And probably has to do with the fact that David was the communicating the same consistent idea. A lot of times what happens is a director will say to the composer, I want you to hit this, 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 this. And then he'll meet with the sound designer and he'll say the exact same. I want you to hit this, this, this. And when you get to the mix, it's a collision of sound. And instead, David had very clear ideas about, he would say to me, you know, this is all going to be a passage of music. Well, that's one of those moments where I can say to myself, what is the one or two acoustic elements I can add that are not going to collide with music? I didn't know what it was until it arrived at the mix. And it's gorgeous. The score is, is fabulous. Which, so. quite frankly, is a smart approach for a low budget film if you got you know if you're gonna uh, you know you're only gonna have a few days to mix it pick That's and right. shoot so yeah. how did you go about you know in in the process i'm curious how did you know where you wanted to favor music over sound design and vice versa how did those moments become clear to you it was like it was a work in progress because we were editing the movie while daniel was writing the score daniel hart who composed the score for it um and and so he, we were sending him, cl you know, every time we had like a 10 minute chunk over the rough cut, we would just send it on over. And he wound up composing enough music to cover more than the length of time of the film. And, and the wonderful thing about Daniel is he is someone who just gets it from the get go. Like he doesn't need a lot of notes. He doesn't, he doesn't have to do a lot of revisions. He usually will pretty much hit exactly what I want without me even knowing it, which is why I love working with him. And... And so he would send all this music in and we would, you know, and that would affect the editing. So he, we'd get a track in, we'd start cutting the movie to that track. And sometimes it wouldn't work, sometimes it wouldn't fit. And we would feel like, okay, this is where the, m the music maybe is getting a little too much. We'll dial it back. And other times we would keep the music in. Uh, you know, while we were mixing it, there were times where we had scenes that had score to it. And it wasn't until we watched the whole movie you know, from front to back, we're like, okay, we're getting a little fatigued by the music, so let's pull it back and push, push up with the, with the sound design. I think that's a great point because uh, you know, there's, uh, we talked about the trend for music in independent film, but there's also, I think, a reverse trend in a, in in larger studio movies of, you know, having 120 minutes of music and a 130 minute movie. Yeah. And I think it it loses its power. It really, I mean, and it really does take watching the movie from beginning to end, which is which is an important lesson for me to learn because there were plenty of scenes where we were just, you know, slapping ourselves in the back because it sounded so good and the music was so great, and then we would watch the whole thing, and you're just like, it's just, it's just a little too much, as beautiful as the music is, and because it was too on the nose with the emotional points, or how do you mean? Well, Physically, I mean, just really just too much. Like it becomes kind of heavy handed when it's in every scene ends up having uh, just what you described. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel the movie, the movie has a musicality to its structure and there are all of the, there are several overtures, so to speak. And, you know, you have one, then another, then another, and then you hit the fourth one and you're like, okay, we get it. This movie's going to have these like series of like sequences that are almost montages with the piece of music that begins this way ends in this climax and then we move on to the next section of the movie and it became it, it got predictable actually and okay. so we were able to you know that's the kind of like judicious use of of sound to like dial back and and kind of keep people on their toes to a certain extent so we've talked a lot about music let's show we uh, I, I, this next clip is uh, kind of specifically about a, for me about a music cue. Do you want to do a set this Yeah, up? this clip this clip was one of the first pieces that Daniel delivered to us and it was one of the it was an instance of actually like recutting a sequence to the score because it was it, it felt so right. It felt the sequence already had a sort of uh, flowy fluid quality and then as soon as the score came in we were 
like, so excited. Like I really brought it to life for the first time. So for the folks who haven't seen the film, do you want to just give a little bit of like what's happening? Uh, yeah. So point? you just saw the beginning of the movie, so to speak. Casey Affleck goes to jail. Rooney Mar doesn't. This is four years after that. All right. Let's roll the second clip, please. So uh, every time I've watched this movie with someone, they always talk about the hand claps in the score. Uh, can you tell me how, where that's, it's such a, I think it's, it just grabs your attention. So it's, it's such a distinctive thing. How, how did that come about? That was an instance of Daniel just having wonderful instincts as to what, you know, what the movie could use and what could, you know, provide a, 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 a musical backbone that was unlike anything anyone had ever heard before. And, you know, I gave him some keywords when we were in some ideas for instruments early on. Like, here's, here's some, you know, things I like, some sounds I like, but I certainly never asked for hand claps. And then he sent that track over, and and that was so exciting to hear for the first time that became the musical motif that runs through the whole film. Yeah, uh, I'm really curious about uh, kind of your process about working with both the composer and with Kent. I mean, you, you talk about having these long conversations with them before, you know, with Kent in the case before you shot. It, sound is so ephemeral and so difficult to discuss. How do you how do you approach that with your collaborators in, in terms of talking about it? With music, it is ephemeral, and I I am not good at talking about it, which is why I value my collaboration with Daniel so much because I don't have to talk to him too much. I mean, we can hang out and and talk about other things, but we don't really talk about music that often. And when we're working together, and he's one of those guys that can just interpret like hand gestures. And know exactly what I'm talking about. So we're like, oh, it's just like, it's too up there. <laughs> and he's like, okay, okay, I get, I get what you're saying. And then it's not kidding. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Like he's he's just on the wavelength, and and that's something that you know when you find someone like that, especially with something as ephemeral as music, you know, hang on tight. Well, yeah, I'm kind of curious about that because I I'm I'm always curious to talk with directors about you know what do you do. And if your director's out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What do you do in that moment when you get something in and it doesn't work, and and you have that sort of sinking feeling in your gut? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you have that conversation? What do you say? What's like? I mean, it can't really just be like it needs. It's uh, more. Well, uh, in the case of my <laughs> first feature, to make the movie with no music at all, except for one track, which Daniel wrote. That's how I met him, and and then um, and really learning. How well you you know can use sound to tell to to function in the way the music does, and so I went down that path. With this film, I mean, Daniel and I are such good friends at this point that I can be very blunt. I can be like, it, "This track doesn't work. This track's too much of this. It's too moody. It's too dark. It's like, what if we tried something um, to offset what we're seeing?" And so it can be. It's very constructive. Uh, without me telling them, like, this needs to be in the key of D, because I don't... Sure, yeah. yeah. But to me, that's what the hand claps did, which was um, they they gave a, a, a lightness and an optimism and a kind of a joy to the track that was such a great offset after this very dramatic, heavy scene that you, you know, seen where the, you know, the lover's being ripped apart. Exactly. I mean, we always were, we always, I used the word ebullient a lot to describe like the tone I wanted and, and there were scenes that w could have been played for suspense that I asked I didn't want to make a suspenseful movie to be honest t for the most part <laughs> and so I, I asked him to, to to change the tone or change the mood of it and, and you know he's a, a a practical guy and just will start over from scratch without you know he understands he's not he's not gonna be precious about it um, and that's a good that's an another, another sign of a good collaborator is that they don't fall in love with what they've done they will under they'll get what you're trying to say and make it work and did you mention that you, you had these tracks while you were cutting, for the most part? A great deal. Like that one we did. Um, the shootout for the beginning was one of the very last tracks that we got. Um, but it was, and that was, a, that was a scene where, you know, where it was tough to find the right, that one went through a lot of iterations, that opening shootout music, um, it, of like being too suspenseful, of being too musical, of being, like we, we, we really spent a lot of time on that track. Even you after you wanted the it to be tonal. And not Tonal, but also not like we didn't want it to just be like an atmosphere track. It was like a really weird fine line that we were trying to hit with that, and so it went through a lot of iterations. There were there were drafts of that that were more of like an action movie, or that were more some like some that had these like the weird drums that came in that were that were uh, really percussive, and there was one version that had 
really sharp violin stabs, almost like a horror film at various points that were timed to the moments on the screen. And it was really cool. It just wasn't right for that scene. So it was, it was a, that was a long process. Or it was just for a different movie. It was a different movie, yeah. And when I say it was a long process, it was like a week because we, <laughs> we were rushing uh, so quickly through everything in, in post-production. How long, I mean, how much time did you guys have in post? Uh, we <laughs> from like August 15th and we, till May? No. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we. I mean, to, to January, basically. Yeah. Like you guys we, finished we shooting the movie in August? Yeah, August Technically 15th. October. And then you premiered it at Sundance. Uh, well, yeah, we, we shot the, n- the, the beginning of the movie in October. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we d- premiered it at Sundance. We, we got, w- we were with Kent, with like. A week s- before. January, like. Thanksgiving to Christmas. Yeah. To New Year's. But we weren't there <laughs> with you until literally like seven days before our premiere. Right. Yeah. Keeping it fresh. Yeah. That's right. The movie Keeping literally will indie. come out uh, uh, like one year from when we wrapped. That's amazing. Great, because it's going to release in August. August right? yeah. 16th, and we, that's when we wrapped last week. That's amazing. We, I don't advise it, but it, it, <laughs> it, it worked out very well for us. But sometimes it does work. I mean, yeah. sometimes it, it works it's good yeah. for the process. You know, you don't, you, there's not a lot of time for hand-wringing in that, no, in that no, situation. No, there isn't. I mean, uh, you look at the film now. You've had some months. I mean, is do you do you uh, do you do you cringe a lot, or is, is there stuff that you'd like to change about it, or is it? There'll never, there never won't be. Of course. Yeah. Um, but there aren't that many things. I don't cringe. And and, w- and and to be fair, we did. You know, because our sound design process was so rushed before Sundance, we knew in advance that we were going to go back and do another few days afterwards, and we and that was a a, a great way to iron out some of those cringes. So you use Sundance as your test screening, basically. Yeah. I mean. And you, sold the film. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good, a successful test screening. No doubt. Uh, Kent, how was it for you having the music available uh, through through your sound design process? Oh, it's great. I mean, the if you're watching the picture with no idea what the music is, or worse yet, temp music, um, you really don't know how much room you have. This movie could have been scored with a full orchestra or it could have been scored with a small folk ensemble, any different sort of uh, conglomeration of instruments you could imagine from reading a script or seeing some of the initial footage. And so to have Daniel's music and have it be such a unique palette of sounds to begin with was really, really exciting. I just said, okay, I know that there n- there's no brass in this movie that's going to you know, cover up a whole bunch of mid-range and make it difficult to let subtle sounds come through. And that made it really easy for me to sort of implement some of David's ideas, which were very much about subtle shifts in tone. In the moments where the score isn't playing, there are, and maybe I'm setting up a a clip, I'm not sure, there are moments where um, we drop out of the natural sound into a tone that is just meant to represent one person's, like, purity of thought or... Um, you know, a moment of solitude. You're getting that, sub- like going from being objective to extremely subjective. Yeah, as you were saying exactly. Earlier. And and basically unrealistic in its subjectivity, and yet hopefully having the audience really be able to connect with the character. So knowing what the palette of the music was and where the music was falling made it really easy to, as you mentioned earli- earlier, not <coughs> excuse me, not waste resources right. in that way. Shall we look at the the arrival of the bad guys? Let's do that. Uh, you want to set it up more than that? <laughs> I'm, oh man, I'm just failing at the setup. You give me a, an in every time and I miss it. The, this is a scene where um, three characters who by their stature are instantly recognizable as villains enter a shop run by Keith Carradine's character who is sort of a, an old time you know, Texas Mafia sort of character and, and he uh, is deeply involved with both uh, Casey and Rooney's lives as, as characters. And then we f- we we're gonna stick around and, and it's actually the second scene. Yeah, well. and then there's a, a scene immediately following um, of Ben Foster and going to pay a visit to to Rooney's character. Okay, let's roll that third clip, please. Uh, I got a totally not sound related question for you. Uh, ben Foster has he spent time in Texas? Uh, well, I don't know uh, prior to the movie, but he came uh, about a month early to to Shreveport, and then we set him up with the Midland police department and he went and spent two Did weeks uh, well, uh, he hung out with uh, a family of sheriffs he and could uh, tell you everything about being a sheriff in yeah texas. he he immersed himself into it i the reason i just yeah, i grew up in texas as we talked we we're talking about earlier and he's just got that kind of good old boy aw shucks way of flirting with women that is uh, he, you know he that, that you see in texas transformed himself so completely that when we saw him after we'd finished shooting 
in New York like a week later. It was like you f- you forget how completely he transformed himself, and then you see him like with his hair cut and without the mustache and talking in his normal accent. You're like, oh, that's right. That was that was who I met originally. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Talk a little bit about the music in that sequence um, and, and uh, how you chose it and the purpose that it served and also the sort of the, the transition between the scenes. Well, David initially had used, uh, I think, a temp track, right? Did uh, Yeah, John Prine song. Yeah, John Prine song, which, you know, we initially had always talked about making it all original music um, anytime you hear a radio or anything, just because we didn't want to take anybody out of the movie. Like, it, we wanted it to be familiar, but not nostalgic in a way that's like, oh, th- I remember when I heard that, or just even take right. you out of it for a second. So I think we sent a couple of different Bob Wills songs to a friend, uh, Jonathan Price, and we got something back that was just beautiful and instantly, like, the right, like, lucky, wow, like, this is better than we were expecting. And it kind of happened every time we asked somebody to write a song. But for this one in particular, it was just like, okay, that fits right in. But we had we had three people who we just tasked with writing every song in the movie. And they, they all ranged from, um, you know, country songs to soul songs to, well, basically just that for the most part, country and soul. But stuff that sounded old and that sounded of a very pr- specific, you know, time period, but had no, p- no one would have any point of reference for. And that was, you know... All like all in, we we didn't want to have any anything in the movie that would ever date it specifically, or have or feel like a reference, or remind you of some other movie that had the same song in it. So that influenced production design, photography, use of cars, costuming, every single music, thing. Yeah, every it was, department. It was, it, the idea was to be as elusive as possible. Because you're not sure is this is this. It kind of has a Sugarland Express vibe from the '70s, and then there's some. So it's really, wh- how, what did that serve narratively for you to 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 root it in a, in, in, a, in a place that wasn't specific like that. Added a degree of plasticity to it that I really felt was useful in making the story feel immediate. And I mean, the story is extremely simple and you could describe it in four words. And it's very, it's, you know, a very traditional old fashioned story. And I felt that any sort of, you know, accentuation of the period would just be window dressing and we could you know really tap into something more immediate by removing that so as kent said before we wanted to suggest that it's a bygone era but aside from that we wanted the time period to be very elusive and to be as non-specific as possible so that you could very quickly just forget about the win like we never wanted anyone to walk by uh a television that had a news report about the Vietnam War or something like that, where all of a sudden you just contextualize the movie in a very specific way. We want it to be as, as free of context as possible, aside from taking place in Texas. That was about all we wanted. It also makes the film much more surreal feeling in, 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 a, in a way. Precisely. Yeah. Ken, how did that affect your sound design choices? Well, I think that's just, um, you get to strip out immediately uh, signature sounds, identifiable sounds. So as you mentioned, you know, no cell phones, no modern electronic blips and bleeps that we're all accustomed to. Anything that becomes an indicator sound, you want to try and get away from that and let the sounds be more diffuse and um, abstracted in, in some way. So um, you know that meant uh, one very minor specific challenge was we want police car sirens that are not contemporary police car sirens. We've got to find that old sort of woo-woo siren in that opening um, chase and shootout scene because that's a specific sound that we obviously need there, but um, it can't be just any police sound. Um, but mostly, I think, to accomplish that involves removing the specificity of particular sounds and letting it rely more on atmosphere and uh, more subjective types of sounds. Uh, another thing I noticed uh, on viewing the movie for the second time, I don't think I heard a single ADR line <laughs> which means you're either a really good dialogue mixer wow. or there was no ADR in the film. Wow. So uh, <laughs> was there a lot of ADR? There are a few ADR lines. I would I never have expected. D- describing it as a lot, though, there isn't a lot. But no, there is, a lot. there is a little bit. and you We did wrestled with them, though. We wrestled with them. And any any mixer will tell you that ADR is just the bane of our existence. It'll never, ever match. Um, I have an elaborate, if anyone wants to talk to me after the panel, I have an elaborate system for getting good ADR. 
<laughs> no one's ever implemented it yet. <laughs> well, actually, I, I had a great trick from, uh, uh, I noticed you worked with Craig McKay on the film. I worked with Craig uh, and another New York uh, editor, Andy Monchi, on a film years ago. And they taught me a great trick for ADR, which was, um, you know, normally when you do ADR, you've got the actor just planted in the middle of the room talking to a huge microphone watching the screen, which is so, uh, how you can't get a good performance. And that's, uh, we hired a boom guy uh, to, you know, so the actor could move around the stage and, and sit where they were sitting and walk where they were walking. And it, it made the performance a lot better. But we, uh, we did that too. We, uh, yeah. the first, there's, a, there's one scene where our first attempt at ADR just didn't sound, it's, it stuck out like a sore thumb. So we redid it and, instructed the engineers to record it as if we were on set, which ended up working great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so w w talk about the challenges of the dialogue mix on this, because, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. A lot of people, I think, you know, kind of suppose it like a big, big effects movie with lots of explosions and gunfire, that that's a huge challenge for a sound mixer. But I actually think that a movie like this, you know, trying to polish the dialogue and make it Especially as, that as scene. possible. <laughs> Especially that. You know, scene. it's because you got nothing to hide behind. You're, you're, you're cicadas. You're, That's really right. True. <laughs> yeah, th there were s particular challenges with this film. One of which is the real life cicadas that were there. Thank God you didn't shoot it this year. Apparently, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> making any movie uh, down there. I suppose it's over now. Um, do, do any of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Cicada, cicada apocalypse. Um, <laughs> But you can't get that sound out of production dialogue. There's no way to get it out. Um, you can't. You, you, don't, have the, you don't have the cicada either. filter at Skywalker. No, has not been invented by Skywalker yet. Um, so what that really involves is obviously filling behind all of the cuts with other very similar cicadas, which we had in abundance, <laughs> and uh, then to try and create a more continuous bed of cicadas because you can't get get rid of them. Um, the challenges with an independent film are always, they almost always come down to the two biggest limitations of an independent film, money and time. And the two are, are linked. So if David did a pass of a scene that was really good for picture and performance and not great for sound, he's going to keep that and move on to the next scene and kind of go, well, we're going to see what we can do with that. And in a lot of cases, you can do things with it to clean up noisy production, bad production. And in some cases you really can't. There's this, I guess that one of the scenes that we just, or part of one of the scenes that we just watched, there's a lot of distortion on the dialogue. Something happened in the production recording and we really couldn't get out of that. And the only way to get out of it, there are three or four characters in that shop. You would have to do ADR for everyone, not an option for uh, financial reasons. So and also for, for performance. And for yeah, performance. The performances are great. So at some point, we look at each other and we go, that doesn't matter so much. Fidelity is not what we're in the business of. You know, the best sounding modern pop record today could be really uninteresting and boring. And an old scratchy record, it's got a lot of feeling. And so this movie, a lot of times we played the old scratchy record card. We said, let it be a little more raw and, and what it is because we're going for the authenticity of performance and things. So Well, and quite frankly, it kind of worked out in your favor in some ways because it, it actually led to the authenticity of the the timelessness of the track almost. Right, you know? right. The, there's a certain character to dialogue uh, in modern contemporary movies where everybody sounds like this. Even if they're just speaking normally, they have that deep, rich voice. And... and Mixers spend a long time making everybody sound that way. If you saw Oblivion, it's a great sounding mix, but even the ladies sound like this. You know, <laughs> everything is just, and we couldn't do that on our movie, and so it feels more like a, a older. Is that, is that what happens because the, the, the mixers have 40 days to mix the film and they might as well uh, do something, right? Might be. I'm not going to say <laughs> specifically that's why that happens. Uh, okay, I guess we exhausted that topic. Um, <laughs> Let's uh, watch uh, Ruth get the letter, yeah? Yeah. Okay, run the next clip, please. You hear Casey narrate those lines that are in the letter and... No, well, I think, yeah, we recorded them and um, and very quickly, I, I can't remember if I actually ever cut it with them or... Did they? Yeah, but it was real quick, no. Like yeah, we very quick, yeah, we decided really quickly not to. Um, this works so much better. It was, it was, you know, there's only a few things you need to know about that and... I really always wanted, that was something in the script, like the idea that the letters are, n like especially there, you're not seeing a POV of it. You're not seeing like her literal POV. You're just like cutting to these 
these shots of the words that jump out the most at her. And, and so that then led into just the whole scene having this very strange, you know, you know, dreamy sort of subjective quality to it. And that was indeed a case where there was music for that whole scene. And the first time we screened it all the way through, we realized that we definitely didn't need any there. And it was actually kind of doing it a disservice. Uh, you, you brought this up earlier, but I'm curious. Talk about that. I mean, to me, that, that just gave me chills, that moment where, you know, you ducked everything out and it went almost completely silent. When, th- when she first hears the, you know, him, you know, or at least reads the words, you know, meet me, t- you know, and then. Right. Well, it's one of the most powerful tools that a filmmaker has. Um, the same as, as editing a picture to go to black you know, can just do this incredible thing to an audience. So the same can be accomplished by dropping sound out. And um, this is a perfect moment to do it. Obviously, we go completely inside Rooney's reaction to this letter, the very complex set of things that are going on for the character as she's reading the letter, because it's not all, oh, great, Bob's out. He's going to come get me, and everything's going to be great. That's not really what she's thinking. And... So it's a beautiful opportunity written right into the story to be able to take the natural world away and be with one character in an isolated sort of emotional moment. And um, Was that written in the script, or how did that idea come about? For the, the sound? or For the silence in that s- moment. No, I mean, it, wa- it wasn't at all. And, and the, the sequence was originally much shorter. Like um, It was just her reading it, and there was music through it, and... And it, we wanted to make it hit a lot harder. And that was, you know, it, we didn't want the movie to, it to feel like just, you know, a scene that was leading to the next scene. It needed to have it become its own thing and, and to, to occupy a certain space in the narrative. And so it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that because a lot of people think, you know, oh, we need to make it stronger. So it needs to be shorter. <laughs> right. Right. But you actually lengthened it. Right. This was, they actually, David added, possibly even after Sundance, um, the shot at the end where Rooney yeah. and Kesa, Casey are there um, kissing again um, th- was something that wasn't there before. Um, and it did extend that moment with the little morning dove sound that sort of is a soft, gentle sound that we all are familiar with as sort of safety and and. There's like a number calm. of, like, you know, the character is going through a really conflicted mental journey in that moment and so the sounds are both comforting like that dove but you also get the crow that's you know more jarring and the wind has an unsettling off-key quality to it so you're really trying to just like capture everything that is going on in her head at that moment which is a great deal of things and i think that uh one of our sound editors actually cut the sound of a rattlesnake in at at that moment (laughs) which we decided was not necessarily emotionally what we <laughs> needed there. Like, so, you know, it wasn't but all... You know, you, you got to... You got you to gotta try it. for trying, right? You got to try it. I, it's, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that, and I, I, I really appreciated um, the room that you gave Kent to play and to, to you know, uh, w- to play with the sound and, and to make those moves. I remember, you know, so often at Skywalker, we would get, you know, an 11th hour call from... A couple of producers in New York who will remain nameless, who are charging hard charging, but uh, their last name starts with W. Um, <laughs> but they, you know, they would take a movie out and test screen it, and it would test poorly, and they would call us up and say, "We need sound design on this movie," and we'd get it, and it was only one person that talks like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and it was wall to wall action or dialogue, and it was like there's no room for right. us to do anything. Right. The so picture's it, not changing, but we need sound design. <laughs> Right, right. Like it was just a like pixie dust that we could just kind of sprinkle over the film. Mm-hmm. But uh, you got to cut with that in mind. You got to edit your picture completely, and and be fluid about it. We were lucky to be able to have some some room to be fluid with timing of things because one of the most important things that often gets overlooked when you're trying just to assemble the story and the scenes as you've written them or you know they need to be to get from A to B in your story is that your characters need time to hear things. And if you give your characters time to actually hear what's happening in the environment, suddenly the audience, of course, by default, is also hearing it, and therefore that much more anchored to the environment. And it's something that if you're just cutting for picture and story, that's often overlooked. And David was really great about being able to say, we do need to open that up a little bit more and give 
a little bit more room, and just to, to have that in mind, that the characters have to inhabit the space, and therefore you need sound for them to hear things as well. It's not, especially if it's not all about the dialogue driving the Well, story. I'm kind of curious, David, you know, I mean, you're a picture editor uh, yeah. a, as well, so how did you end up, how did Craig McKay end up, uh, you know, getting involved with this movie? He's like an old school New York, you know, he's a fantastic editor, most commonly associated with, um, uh, I'm having a scene Science of the Lambs. Yeah, all Jonathan, Jonathan Demi's, Demi's movies, movies. Yeah. exactly. He, um, one of our producers, Amy Kaufman, had worked with him prior to this on a film called Sin Umbre. And um, we were at a point in the edit where I was like, I could use some fresh eyes, and she recommended him. So he came on for a few weeks to, to work on it. And He came down to Dallas and worked with you guys? I wish, because I, lo <laughs> I would love to have worked at, at home. <laughs> but no, it this was all in New York. We cut the whole oh. movie in New York. Okay. And, and yeah, so he, he came on from like, a, you know, like five or six weeks and just, you know, He's got a great, I, you know, I, I'll go off on my highfalutin artsy ideas, and he's like, no, let's focus on the story, and let's let's get to the to the heart of the matter, and and that's something that was very useful to do, to, to think about it in more pragmatic terms at that point in, in the editing process. Uh, especially, I imagine that's difficult, because you wrote the script, so there are probably moments that, you know... The thing that they always say, you know, and I know this as, a, as an editor, is like, you know, you want to kill all of your babies, and so... I was going into this thing, okay, I've got to not be in love with anything, and I just cut everything out. Like, the first cut of the movie was missing several major characters, because I was like, I that, that's a baby, i got to get rid of it. And I mean, I'm not joking. Um, so how was watching that cut? It was uh, really disconcerting. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know. We both went there. Like, uh, we started editing really quick. Um, so it was mainly just like, I, I always just encourage him to do whatever, you know, because I knew that, we would get back to it, you know. He's got to be. You've got to be able to do that to cut out those important scenes we'll and look it's at it. Yeah, exactly. It's not I like you're cutting the negative. You can always undo it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So that we went through a lot of different iterations of of scenes and whole entire storylines that were cut out. Um, yeah. I mean, the first cut that you saw was the cut that I had finally gotten to a point where I was happy with, and it was like the tone cut. It was like I'm just going to cut everything according to maintaining a consistent tone. So the scenes were not in the order there and now and and there were some things missing that were narratively important but like at that point we hadn't figured out how to tonally incorporate them into the movie and so I, I just got a cut that was a feature of film length cut of a tonally cohesive movie and and that was a really big step of of figuring out what this movie is going to feel like and then you can go back and start putting it back together according to the narrative and and getting the 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 necessary beats that you need, and the the plot points, and the everything that that was you're having trouble with before, we we're able to like figure out how to include that in that tonal consistency. And I'm really glad I didn't start cutting the sound on that version, <laughs> because it was all <laughs> stuff going back into the movie that I yeah know, that I didn't see. So it was better to. Wait. And you did all that experimentation between August and January, <laughs> along oh. with another you know week of production too. Wow. It was it was a compressed period of time. Um, let's, uh, you want to set up the, our final clip? Um, yes, this clip is one of my favorite scenes in the movie and for a number of reasons. And it's a scene where Casey is preparing to make good on that letter you just saw and go drive to, to Rooney's house and he's just stealing himself up for it. All right, let's roll that last clip, please. So David, when you were mapping the sequence out, when you were working on it, how do you, I mean, how did you sort of know emotionally what you wanted that scene to do, and how did that translate into your conversations about music? It was, it was very, that was a very malleable point of the movie, and to the point that that scene wasn't scripted until the morning we shot it, and in the script it just said, Casey washes his face and puts a shirt on, and I always knew we'd put something in there, um, but... I didn't know what until we were about ready to shoot, and I gave Casey four different monologues you that, know, that you morning that you had written that I'd written, and was like, "Just run with these. Like, we'll just keep the camera rolling." And and um, and so he did, and that w it was amazing. And so as we were editing it together at this point in the movie, you know, the various narrative threads are starting to kind of start to come together, and it's you know, building towards something. And and then that came through in the sound, which to be honest, I don't remember 
ever knowing exactly what it would sound like till we got to the room and you had because Daniel had written some mus some score for it and then we had all the live music that was being played downstairs and and that was something that wasn't intended to be that was from a different scene but we had a lot of extra music. and it feels like it was all designed to work perfectly it together yeah it wasn't and then and then so I'd cut all that live music in there and um and then we had the score but I'd never in the edit really mixed the two together at all in any sort of significant way. In fact, that piece of score, I had never even heard the final version of it because it was we were so it was so late in the game. Like getting all the f act getting the score recorded with the real instruments and everything was was very you know late in the process. And so it wasn't until we were in the mix working on it that I heard that. So were you working with like a like a roughed out synth version of of the score? No, no, there was no synth version. They of weren't the score. synth because Daniel's an amazing but it violinist. Was all but it was all like stuff that he did in my house. Like then, then he went to right. a studio to do it at somebody else's yeah. house. Yeah, I see. Okay. So there were sketches of what was going to be there. But the thing that really came together in the f in the final mix is what you what you pointed out is the sort of unifying feel of the whole scene. Even though we're in several different locations, we've got the music downstairs in the bar that you can kind of hear, and then we cut down to the bar and we see it, and the score swells in and the score yeah. dips out. And they're in the same key. Th was that an accident? No, that I mean, Toby can speak to that. <laughs> I mean, no, no, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> More of the serendipity. No. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Did you talk to Daniel about making it in that key? I mean, Curtis was like, I think, vamping in C, if I had to guess. <laughs> yeah. And that was unscripted as well. But we had all these musicians there, and David was like, Look, I want to get the flavor of this room. Let's shoot these people playing this. And Curtis just made that up on the spot. Wow. And yeah, and then Daniel did write a lot of the score in a, he knew what music like had been written, like the songs and stuff. And so wrote, he wrote a, a lot of the score with the idea that, you know, it might be mixed in with songs here and there. But it, w it, it I mean, it really was, this was a serendipitous and moment for me. And there's another scene later that builds out of a later moment of this where the score really does bloom right out of this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and he would do that often. I mean, there is a part where, Ben's playing guitar right. and just strums, and then Daniel just literally continued that his strum into a song on the same guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's some really beautiful um, blurring of the lines between you know music that inhabits the world of the film and music that floats over the the world of the film. And this is like a really great example of a scene that holds up just fine without any music. Like you can just Casey's a great actor and he's you know doing a wonderful performance. And in the edit, we're always like, this is a great scene. And we, we didn't have any question about that. But once you start binding it together with those sonic elements, especially like when he's talking and like the music doesn't change its key. It's just like one sustained note that you can, you don't, you forget that you're hearing and you're, you are hearing the music from downstairs. But then when that blossoms back out again, um, it really has a tremendous effect and, and takes it to the next level. Yeah. That's great. Well, Paul tells me that we need to uh, go to questions. So uh, can we uh, get, I can't see anything. Can we uh, get some questions from the audience? The questions about how this, everything feels poetic and whether that was intended in the script or if it came later. And it was, I mean, the script is, is very, very simple. And I really wanted to do something that was a very traditional story, but with a sort of, I mean, I, I don't like to personally use the word poetry, but that had a, like a lyricism to it. And and that was certainly intentional from the very beginning. It's a really great great question. Um, to me, if there's if there is something happening in the sound that is suddenly breaking your connection with where the characters are in that particular moment, then you're potentially going overboard with the sound design. Um, it's a very fine line between being able to add things that didn't really happen or aren't real or our subjective sounds uh, to enhance what we're experiencing and you can very quickly and very easily go into the point where people notice what's happening and so I like to say that you know you want the mind to hear it but the ear not to hear it or vice versa depending, depending on, on how what you need yeah. depending on how you see that um, and I think that in a movie such as this and in a lot of independent films where really the, the driving consideration is staying with characters and story, 
you have to be very considered and restrained about what you do with sound because it's not a showcase for you to, to make your statement. It's about supporting the narrative of the individual characters, keeping them placed in the location of the story, which is a big thing for me. I like having characters that are inhabiting an acoustic space. And so I actually tend to sneak a lot of sound design in, in the atmospheric world of the film because I think I have some room to do it there. And uh, a lot of the insects and cicadas that you hear in this film are completely not cicadas <laughs> or insects. They're things that I created that continued the evocative, somewhat dreamy atmosphere of the film. So I hope that answers your question. And one thing I wanted to add to that was that a fun thing for me that I, you know, having never gone through this process before, was coming in and like hearing what the Foley team had cut in, which was an effect for everything that happens on screen. <laughs> and so you have that at your disposal if you want to use it and then dialing it back as needed, which was, it was just fun to hear like all these things that all of a sudden had sound added to them. And then we're like, okay, that's, that's too much. That's too much. Let's take it back. But right there, that one sound is really effective. Right. There are a lot of moments in, in films, especially a film such as Ain't the Body Saints, where you have this opportunity to pull all sound away. And it's, as I said earlier, it's a really effective, powerful tool, and it's great. Cinema seen in an environment, environment such as this is a great opportunity to make a space that's actually quieter than what the audience experiences when you walk out on the street. Um, we have somewhat soundproof rooms here and great speakers, and you can really bring a sound down, like when Sylvie, the little girl, is waking her up in the morning, says, and we can all hear that because we're in a great environment for hearing small sounds. So I think it's really just staying tuned in to the dynamic range of the, the emotions of the soundtrack. Well, and I think uh, conversely, there's a, real, uh, the, uh, there's a real danger that I see happening all the time. I think it's one of the reasons why there's so much music in movies now and why movies are just so damn loud, which is uh, I think it's the problem of filmmaker fatigue which you know you, you guys were so fast through the process you actually probably didn't get it in in that same way but you know if you've been editing on a movie for a year you know you take a look at it and it doesn't work anymore you know it's not f it's it's really hard to continually try to look at the film with the same first set of eyes that you did when you first saw it and so i think a lot of filmmakers compensate by w we got to juice it up we got to juice it up it's you know it was really helpful because we showed the movie in january at our premiere and then we scheduled time to come back in late March to finish the mix, so to speak. And in that time, get a, you know, take a break from the movie. Yeah. And going to look at it with fresh eyes was, it was extremely valuable because we were able to like trim some things with the picture and make little tweaks here and there. And, and then with the sound, like hear it for the first time all over again, which is ag again, and, and you were able to then spend the time to get those design elements that we were just talking about to, to really pay off. Right. I think he's asking what, what the submission for Sundance was. Oh, the was. submission. Not Is that what, what you were played. asking or what played at the festival? Uh. It had, I mean, when I cut things, I'm cutting sound effects in. We had the music in because the music was being written or a lot of it, but we certainly, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't nice. It was, it was like, it was, it was like, rough. yeah, it, it was like, you know, the same gunshot every time a gunshot was fired. It, it was, you know, the same truck sound every time a truck drove by. It was just placeholders. And then the music was all the sketches that were done um, in at Toby's house, and it was it was certainly rough. I mean, the movie, the cut itself was very, very rough, but it was watchable. It felt like you know you could you could look at it and say, I see the potential of a film there, and luckily they saw that. Luckily, yeah. <laughs> Paul tells us that we have to wrap it up. So um, I want to thank the panelists. This thank is you all so much. Thank you all. Interesting. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>